would like to introduce Professor Katarina Svanberg, Professor at the Department of Oncology at Lund University. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much again for, for letting me be here and for uh, giving me this opportunity to, um, to talk to you. And today uh, I would like to uh, discuss a little bit how we can use the utilize different um, laser-based spectroscopic techniques to detect cancer, because cancer is, of course, my field. I am an oncologist. And um, uh, as we said, as we heard here, I work in, in Lund, but I also work in China, at South China Normal University. And what you see here is the floor that we are now occupying, building up this new center. So this is together with Professor Sai Lin Hui, and uh, the director of the university who really has played a good role in building up these new centers. So Guangdong province, where Guangzhou is located, is one of the most fast-growing regions in China, I would say. There are many clinical challenges in oncology, and one very important aspect is to detect the cancer early. Because if we detect early cancer, we have much better outcome for the patient. If we treat late, we know that the prognosis for the patient is much less. And we come with cases where we can absolutely do nothing. And that's common in oncology, unfortunately. So what we do have to uh, consider here is that we should be able to visualize even pre-cancer, before it goes into cancer. And uh, fluorescence, for example, laser-induced fluorescence, has the potential of uh, visualizing the biomolecular changes in the tissue before the architecture changes, which means that this is even before you can see in the microscope the changes. So we have a great challenge there to utilize this period when... Uh, when we have no other modalities to use. And um, of course also another important aspect is to try to separate inflammation from neoplasia. Because inflammation may look like for the naked eye exactly the same as early cancer. But of course the treatment should be so different if it's an inflammation or if it's an early cancer or a precancer. We um, have, from the point of view, to uh, be able to define the treatment area. And that is not always very easy, actually. And here again, we can use these optical techniques to show where the tumor borders are. And uh, in uh, particular uh, um, organs, like in the brain, for example, it's extremely crucial not to take normal tissue, which should not be taken away. So there are many many examples where we can show that we have a real challenge to meet. I said that uh, to treat tumors early is the important aspect, actually. I show here for uh, lung cancer, five-year survival for different staging in lung cancer. If we have a stage one tumor, that means a small tumor, less than two centimeters in diameter, no lymph metastasis. We treat 60% of the patients to full cure. This is a low number in general for oncology. In oncology in general, we talk about 50% uh, full cure in all areas. But for this particular cancer with a small tumor, the number is 60%. If the tumor grows a little bit bigger, above two centimeter, but still without any lymph nodes, the number goes down, as you see, dramatically. And if it's a disseminated disease, which means that it has metastasis in the body, we treat only maybe 1% to full cure. So this really gives us an indication how important it is for us to discover the tumors early. When we talk about tumors, there are both the benign tumors and the malignant tumors. And it's a strict difference in between malignant and, and benign uh, growth. We have here an example of a benign fibroadenoma of the breast. 
we see the line here in between normal tissue, which is beneath here, and the tumor. And this line is not crossed over by the cells. While if we look at the carcinoma instead, this is a uterus carcinoma, we see that there is no border anymore. This, this line is not so clear for us. And the invasion of cells can easily happen as we don't have this barrier. And that might be due to the fact that the collagen here is loosened up by the collagenase uh, 4, which really works as something that, that um, metabolizes the collagen and makes the tumor cells make for them easy to, uh, to go through this barrier. So, so this is a very good example on how different the, the tumor growth maybe. I will go through some lists here of clinical challenges in medicine. And uh, to start, for example, with surgery, I said it before, it's very important to be able to delineate the malignant tissue from normal in order to increase the radicality and to prevent recurrences. Because if we leave cells there which are malignant, we are sure that they regrow. For neurosurgery, as I said, important not to take away tissue that shouldn't be taken away, but on the other hand, to fight this, what some people call the gorilla astrocytoma glioma cells, which are out there in the parenchyma. Um, this type of tumor is very, very hard to kill, actually, and, and we have very bad um, prognosis for these patients. And even if you take away most of, of one part of the, the brain, we are quite sure that, that it will regrow on the other side. So this is a tumor that, that has bad prognosis, but it has been a lot of uh, promising research there both from the treatment and from the detection point of view. For pulmonary, um, lung cancer, it's, you, I showed you the picture, it's again very, very important to find the early occult cancer. And it might even be that the patient has so small tumors so we cannot visualize them by any technique of the conventional ones, but they still have indications of hosting um, uh, malignant cells. We, we look at the sputum that comes up. For gastroenterology, there are many, many aspects where we really have challenges to meet, unmet needs maybe, to identify flat lesions in the large intestine. Flat lesions are the ones that uh, the, endoscop then the endoscopy doctor oversees in 25% of the cases. They are there, but they are flat and they are not so easy to recognize. So this is one aspect here. Again, to separate neoplastic from non-neoplastic polyps. What is that? That is to separate out these polyps which are there, which should be taken away from these which could sit there forever. And why is that important? Because polypectomy is not um, a trivial um, treatment modality. People might even uh, die from it. We had a colleague in Italy who was uh, going through this polypectomy, uh, quite um, normal procedure during the night. He started to bleed very silently, and in the morning he had no chance to, to be cured. And that is a good example on <coughs> how important it is really to be aware where we should excise tumors or polyps in this case, and where we shouldn't. Ulcerative colitis is a disease that has a connection with carcinoma. And uh, of course, in these patients in particular, it's very, very important to find these tumors and to go through them very, very carefully to also see if we can find the early carcinomas. We talked yesterday about Barrett's esophagus, a disease that is uh, unfortunately increasing. We see that it has to do with uh, stressful 
work conditions, we believe. It uh, relates to the, to the flush of, of fluid from the stomach going up in the esophagus and irritates the mucosa and causes, after a while, dysplasia. And um, depending on what country you live in, uh, the, the number of biopsies are different. And uh, some, some people uh, tend to take every second centimeter. If you live in Germany, they take every half centimeter. So that depends where you are from, how eager you, you can be to diagnose the, the dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. From urology point of view, it's uh, a particular interesting case because there, the more uh, common tumors are the papillary growing tumors, and they are very easy to see. They, they look like mushrooms uh, or seagrass or whatever. They, they are sitting there, and they are easy to, visit, to, to, um, to uh, have a visible uh, appearance. But if there are flat, small tumors in situ, behind or, or in, in the neighborhood of these, they are also very easy to oversee. And these are the ones which are life-threatening. The papillary tumors, they can easily be taken away, and usually they, they recur, yes, but you go in again and you take them away. But the flat lesions, the in situ carcinomas, they don't go up, they go down which means that they grow through the muscular um, layer and, and are life-threatening. Gynecology, I will go through that with the, with the cervical area. And there again, you have the human papilloma virus infection and uh, causing this um, condyloma acuminata, which is a disease that can cause cancer, but it can also be healed nicely and not everything that looks red and swollen is cancer. It can also be an inflammation. Uh, I will also uh, show some examples from skin, and uh, in particular, how difficult it is for the dermatologists, also the skilled ones, to really see which tumors or which lesions should be uh, excised and which are only something that could sit there. And um, for the ENT, I know we have some, some uh, dentists in the audience here. It's, of course, to, again, find the early tumors. And that is in the leukoplakia. We saw that from, uh, from uh, Colin Hopper's work, how the late tumors are very hard to treat. So, so um, this is an indication where they have early, early cancer onset here. Recurrent laryngeal cancer is another important um, group here, 25% of the laryngeal cancers which are surgically removed by thermal laser recur. And so this is an indication here for finding good treatment modality. And I will finish off with discussing a little bit of um, neonatology or pediatrics because we have developed a technique that we belie believe could be um, transferred into the pediatric um, ward to uh, develop a surveillance system for these small kids being born prematurely because the problem for them is the lung function. They have not mature lungs, so that means that they cannot um, have the oxygenation of the organs sufficiently, and that is, uh, in principle, the brain is the, the most uh, important organ here to, to protect. There are many conventional diagnostic techniques, of course. The problem is that what I said now can, in many cases, not be covered with these conventional techniques. X-ray imaging, of course, CT scanning, they are fine down to uh, approximately one centimeter. And why one centimeter? We see smaller tumors, by, but by definition, we usually say clinically that the tumor, that lesions uh, smaller than one centimeter, they are not malignant. And that's a very crude measure. Um, taken into account, for example, that many, many tumors put micrometastasis. And, uh, for example, prostate cancer or pancreas cancer, 
the, the tumors there or the metastasis there, they are usually very, very small. So the one centimeter measure is, uh, is not always valid. It's a good sort of approximation, but not more than that. MRI for intraspinal tumors and for solid tumors, for example, the muscle tissue, ultrasound, a very, very elegant way of detecting a lot of things. For example, cysts in parenchyma to differentiate out that from tumors. Scintigraphy, PET, SPECT, with the radioisotope distribution and to find tumors. So these, these uh, conventional diagnostic techniques are very valuable. But what they don't do for us is to show the very early cancer. And we have uh, this time scale here where the biological onset might be years from the usual diagnosis. And this is a period of time we should use to develop our, uh, or, or to use our techniques that we develop for detection. Because when we have the biological onset, there might be absolutely no signs in the patient. Because this is a preclinical disease. But when the symptoms come, there might be too, too late to treat. And what I will go through now is mainly fluorescence, but I will also discuss the other techniques. We discussed yesterday photodynamic therapy. And there we use red light to penetrate as deep as we can, which is not so deep, but at least a few millimeters. When we do the fluorescence, now taking into account that we are only interested in the very shallow lesions, we shouldn't use the red light to penetrate many millimeters into the tissue. We should only use light that penetrates very shallow. And that's the reason why we use the UV or uh, blue light, because if we use the red light, we penetrate too deep and the upwelling fluorescence is diluted by signals from areas that might not be malignant. So that's the reason why we use this um, type of excitation wavelengths. The spectroscopic techniques are fluorescence, reflectance, elastic scattering, and Raman spectroscopy. And they are all good and maybe even better if we could combine them, not only using one or the other. This is from uh, joint um, collaboration with um, the Photonic Center in Jena, where we have used um, tau photon fluorescence microscopy, second harmonic generation, and uh, CARS, the, the, uh, the Raman spectroscopy. Uh, and we have here good examples on how the different techniques really detect different uh, different uh, subs substances or different um, com components in the, the tissue. For example, with the two-photon <coughs> uh, fluorescence microscopy, we see nicely the elastin, while with the second harmonic generation uh, microscopy, we see the collagen nicely. And with the car spectroscopy, we see other things. We see, for example, the fat which is included here in the, this is a, a microscopy slice, and we see how this tumor has built up a lot of fat, and we believe this is the first time we could show that very aggressive tumors build up nutrition vacuoles to survive. And, and that is quite interesting, and we did not see that with the other techniques, so we, we needed really a, a composition here, a, a, to combine all these techniques to really be sure what we were looking at. Fluorescence spectroscopy sometimes is called optical biopsy because it is an optical tissue characterization to uh, compare with histopathological examination where you send off the tissue and get the result. Here we have a non-invasive technique which gives us an indication in real time. We can take the laser light through the endoscope in the biopsy channel, and uh, we can sort in that way reach organs which the endoscopist usually are interested in. We do it in a point monitoring, more scientific mode, but the ultimate goal is, of course, to have a full image of the tissue. When we excite the autofluorescence, which is the fluorescence from the tissue itself, 
we see the different components with different uh, emission wavelengths here. But what we really collect is a, co a composite of all these. So we, we see uh, 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 some uh, signal of all these, but there are different uh, information from the different ones. I said that we could <coughs> do it point monitoring, which means that we have all, uh, we have the full information, all colors in one single spot. So we detect from one single spot the fluorescence, while when we do the imaging, we, we choose a few wavelengths, one or, or few colors over the whole area. And I will show some examples on how this works. This is from Wagner's publication very quite early, 1998, where he showed the excitation spectra and the emission spectra for, for many of the chromophores or fluorophores in the body. And you can easily understand that to excite, for example, tryptophan, you really need to be deep down here in the blue area or UV area, or while, for example, the porphyrins are nicely excited up at, uh, towards the red part of the wavelengths. The tissue chromophores that we use are both the extracellularly located, like collagen, elastin, but also intracellular. And important for cancer detection is, for example, the coenzyme NADH, NAD+, because that has different balance in normal and in uh, tumorous tissue. We saw some of these uh, posters yesterday, and I think one explanation there why the signal goes down is exactly the balance in between these two. Collagen also plays a good role there for detecting. Another thing which I don't have there, which is not a chromophore, is the blood absorption. But because the blood reabsorption, we believe, is one important aspect also. When we uh, develop these new techniques, we have to keep in mind that uh, the, the goal, of course, should be to be very highly sensitive and very specific, have a high specificity. And uh, if we have a disease, we don't want to have a false negative result. And if there is a positive test, it really should be because it is a disease. And that's, of course, what people are struggling. And we always should uh, present our studies with our specificity and sensitivity data. I showed yesterday um, this map over Europe here, and I will go through as an example, as a few examples of these clinical trials, and I will uh, go through the cervical area, I will show something from skin, large intestine, and urinary bladder. And we start with a quite interesting study that we did in the Baltic States, um, Lithuania. This was within an effort in improving women's health, and uh, it was the cervix that was our area we investigated, and the study objective was to spectroscopically characterize normal, pre-malignant, malignant tissue, but exactly what we were out after was to see whether we could, we could see the inflammation, the infection, and separate out that from the early cancer. We included 111 patients. It was in collaboration with Lithuanian Oncology Center and uh, at the, the university hospital, the gynecology department. And the patients were mainly young, uh, young females. And this was the area we were investigating. 95% of all uterine cervical cancer comes from this area, which is the ports you, where the, the birth channel ends. And we collected spectra from all these patients. And this is one example here where we have this nice uh, high intensity spectra marked here uh, green and blue. And then we found spectra that looked like this one. And this spectrum has a characteristic uh, decrease in uh, overall fluorescence intensity, but it also has a red shifted peak. So approximately 60 nanometer red shifted. So this gave us an indication that, that this could be uh, uh, not healthy tissue. We did the biopsy, and the answer was that it was a carcinoma in situ, although it was, from the point of view of visual inspection, absolutely not possible to see. This is a clinical setter 
for fluorescence imaging. We were working together with a company in um, the US here. And this was how we did the cutting of the samples that we took out. Very intense work within this study. We, we did cut every piece here in slices, so we did go through this with histopathology, and we correlated everything with our, um, our spectroscopic data. So an enormous uh, amount of work, actually. And these are the numbers that came out we could separate out uh, carcinoma in situ and uh, differentiate out that from cervicitis, which is the inflammation, with numbers which are approximately the same as for pap smear. But what we could offer the patients here was an immediate diagnosis. We did, as I said, also um, imaging. One example here, a patient who had this bone, which was uh, a carcinoma, Sitting on this side, the fluorescence image showed nicely the same area. But on the other side, we saw absolutely nothing by the visual inspection. But still, it was in fluorescence, approximately the same as the one which was easy to visualize. And afterwards, when the patient went through the miniconization, we could also, from the pathology, have the result that... Um, it was exactly the same type of tissue, even though not visibly uh, seen. I said before that for the large intestine, the trick is here to separate out these ones from the non-neoplastic. These polyps, they host already, when they are a polyp, 10% carcinoma in situ. So these should be taken away while these are not um, anticipated to grow into any dangerous status. But they look very similar. This is a, a, tumor, this is a polyp, which is a non-neoplastic tumor, or, or polyp, I would say, and this is a neoplastic. They are approximately 5 millimeter in diameter, and by spectroscopy we could actually separate out these, which were the neoplastic, and that was... Um, in collaboration with a group at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. I said before that we can use this for, um, for a brain tumor identification. We had one poster yesterday where, we sh where it was shown exactly this, and this is from the university in Linköping, where they combined the MRI and the fluorescence, and they put the fiber through bar holes, like we see here, into the brain and they follow the path into the tumor and see where the borders are. Urinary cancer is, as I said, a particularly interesting um, case because we have these tumors which are so easy to see, but then we have the little carcinoma inside to here, which never go up and show itself like this. It goes directly, directly down into the bladder wall, and that's the reason why they are more dangerous, because they are not so easy to visualize. We have here, this is a, a joint work that we did with some urologists in uh, St. Peter Hospital in Leuven, Leuven in Belgium. We have the endoscopic view here, and you can see a slight red area here, which actually in fluorescence image shows perfectly all right and this was also one of these carcinoma in situ. A lot of work uh, has continued down in Munich with Herbert Stepp, where he has good result, and they use it, as I understand now, conventionally when they localize early cancer in the bladder. And this is one of the books here, handbook. And again, a very good example. You have the tumor here, which is one of these papillary tumors, if we look around here, it's very hard to say anything but in fluorescence. This is ALA-induced protoporphyrin fluorescence. We see nicely this one, which is equal in fluorescence as the one which is visible. But go back here and you cannot see anything. So this has a potential of really uh, giving the, the urologists a good guidance for, for the tumor spread. Uh, for skin cancer, we have exactly the same, and I, I talked about that yesterday, and here we have the, the possibility to use these techniques for border identification, and this is simple 
equipment here with the fiber. I do the scan over the tumor and try to find the borders and spectra like this come out. We have the healthy tissue. This is a patient who had ALA uh, topical sensitization. So we have the signal of protoporphyrin here. This is a healthy tissue. This is this point here and we see how, how the autofluorescence dominates the signal. If we compare to the tumor, inside the tumor, we have a very high intensity over the protoporphyrin in the red part of the wavelength spectrum, while the intensity in the autofluorescence goes down dramatically. And this is the basis for <coughs> doing the, the um, imaging where we take these wavelengths which are of importance. We see this one, we see this one, and they are the ones that really should be utilized for this. And build up the image like we show here. We take a very, very simple ratio. We take this, the signal which we mark A here, here which is uh, the sensitizing agent. We take away the background, the yellow here, and we divide by the blue. So this is something that increases in tumor and this decreases. So that means that we have a nice tumor demarcation or enhancement and what it also has is that it gives us dimensionless values as we divide away the, this by, by this ratio formation. A benign or malignant tumor sitting on the back here of the patient. We do the imaging and we see how uh, we can follow the fluorescence image over the tumor. But this area corresponding to this one here does not show up, and the reason for that is that it is actually a benign nevus. Even though it looks very similar, but it does not fulfill the cancer criteria, and therefore it's not shown in fluorescence. So we would really like to have this little equipment that tells us what kind of lesion we are looking at. And that might be this one, which is um, based on both fluorescence and reflectance. And the system looks like this, where we have LEDs for exciting the fluorescence, but also for uh, measuring the reflectance, because we think it also has to do with the blood absorption. Optical coherence tomography was shown uh, in some other talk, and I will just show that as one example of a success story because after uh, some years, this is now a conventional technique in the clinic, in particular for in ophthalmology, and this is some work from, uh, Wolf, from De Drexler in Vienna now. The skin cancer, as I said, has a lot of costs with it, because it's very, very common. It's uh, more common year by year, and uh, we have this problem to know what is what. And I, I have a list here which really shows you how many other non-melanoma pigmented lesions are there. And that really relates to these numbers here. When I say that only 2% of the patients who were operated had malignant tumors, but it might have been some of these other tumors. And you see from the list all the way down here, they are benign and they should not be operated. Then we have this, uh, we again have some benign lesions here. And so out of this list, approximately 90% are benign, but they are pigmented. So we are scared, of course, not to take them away. But if we had much better detection possibilities, we would not uh, excise these tumors, or le I would not even call them tumors, lesions. And I showed this yesterday, and that's worth showing again, because it again tells us that tumors can be embedded in normal tissue, even though we don't see them. And that's, of course, important to, to reveal these areas and to include them in the treatment area, to be sure that, that we treat them to full um, radicality. And here, PDT could be used. We could use surgery also. But in this case, of course, PDT is ideal because we don't have any scar afterwards and no deformation in the face. I will show some examples on how uh, uh, we have tried to, uh, to figure out whether there are something more to be done with the topical application with other sensitizing agents than the ones 
uh, based on ALA. Uh, this is a temoporphin topical use, topical drug, which is um, in, uh, in a particular uh, formulation. So our aim here was to try to figure out whether we could use this instead of ALA to, to have better penetration or, or better, better uh, results. This is how it works when Lund University Medical Laser Center goes around in Europe. We bring our equipment in big, big um, steel um, packages and um, pack it up and do the, the experiments with other researchers. And Europe has had a, a very good system of building up networks. Through Brussels money, we apply for, uh, for uh, this um, centers to, to do research and, and uh, I would say that Europe recently or during the last few years have really been able to show uh, how the, the networking can increase the possibility to, to develop different techniques and, and we have been involved in several of these European uh, projects. This particular one uh, included animals, 30 animals. It was a new tumor seeking uh, um, formulation, not a new drug, but a new formulation. It was in a liposomal solution. And we did the surface monitoring and we also did some monitoring of the uptake in uh, deeper into the animals. What we saw was that it had a selective accumulation. It had an optimal uh, drug light interval of four hours. We should compare that when we give it systemically. We use it 96 hours after. This was good four hours after. And uh, we could also see that the concentration of uh, mesotetrahydroxyphenylchlorine was high enough for uh, PDT effect to occur. We also uh, measured <coughs> and compared uh, with, uh, with the, the chemically with the HPLC and uh, could find that we had good correlation in between the fluorescence signals, but of course, as we know, the fluorescence detects only the surface. This is a tumor cut open. So we see that we had a good penetration, the, four, the first one millimeter, but down t further down we had very little uptake, and we see that also here. The fluorescence is at the top. So that was a little bit discouraging, because we had anticipated a much deeper penetration. We did some fluorescence measurements where we detected the signal at 720 nanometers, so we excited uh, in the red part of the wavelength region just to, if you remember, then we penetrate much deeper, so we could see actually the, the fluorescence inside the tumor even though it was located um, a little bit deeper into the tissue and that was due to the fact that we excited with the red light instead of the blue. As I said, we did the chemical extraction of all the organs, which is a t very time consuming job. And we, after that, took it to the clinic and um, tried it also on patients. And uh, we saw quite good uptake again. Remember that this is a surface uptake and we saw a good um, photo bleaching after the treatment. We treated approximately 15 patients, but the outcome was approximately the same for superficial tumors as it was for ALA, so we didn't gain so much. This is another example where we have fluorescence over the tumor, and you see the nice uh, signal from the, the FOSGAN here, or, or the, the, this FOSGEL. Um, uh, production. Uh, I will finish off by showing some of our work that we have done with um, gas monitoring. Gas in scattering media absorption spectroscopy. This is absorption of gases, not of the tissue, uh, tissue components. And that means that we have laser source that fits the absorption of the gas we are interested in, and we have a detector. And we are out after finding whether this technique could be used, for example, for detecting um, sinusitis in the facial uh, hollow uh, 
organs or hollow, hollow um, areas or volumes we have here. Because the problem, of course, is that people with sinusitis have uh, different genesis of the disease. And only the ones who have bacteria should have antibiotics. And here we are sitting on a bomb, I would say, a, a global uh, threat. Because we give, as doctors, too much antibiotics to patients which should not have it. We know that, for example, for the sinusitis, 80% uh, of the patients who get antibiotics, they have virus or they have some kind of allergia or some kind of, of other genesis and not bacterial genesis. And that's uh, only the bacterial sinusitis that should have antibiotics. So what I said is that the gas absorption is, of course, so different from the, the chromophores and from the, the tissue itself. And it's very sharp absorption line here. It's uh, down to, to this, this number, for example. It's so, so sharp uh, that the, the signal that we are detecting. So it's quite different from what I have discussed before. And as I said, we have um, tried out whether we could use that for the sinuses. And as I said, sinusitis is a very common disease. There is no easy diagnostic tool available. So here again, we have a clinical challenge, actually. And uh, what we do is uh, the diagnostic methods is the clinical examination, which is not so precise, of course. And in few cases where they have chronic uh, uh, symptoms, we do the computer tomography. This is one of our patients here. This is a sinus on uh, the, the maxillary sinus, which is a healthy one. This is filled with something, but it's very hard to say. This is the CT scan, and it's very hard to say what is in here. Is it fluid? Is it mucosa that is swollen? Or is it pus, which is the debris from the, the, the bacteria? We included in this clinical trial 40 patients. They were referred to do CT scanning because they had uh, chronic symptoms of, of uh, sinusitis. The system looks like this. We have two lasers, one laser that fits the oxygen and one laser that fits the, the water vapor because we use the water vapor to uh, normalize our signal, our, our oxygen signal because the, the content of, of water can be read off in a table if we know the temperature. So we can use this signal from water uh, to normalize our oxygen signal, which we show here. And the ratio comes out um, equal at the right and left side because we have uh, used this as, uh, the, as a normalization. What we have done here with this patient is that we did flush his nose with nitrogen and measured during wh while he was breathing normally, but he was flushed with nitrogen, and we see that the oxygen is uh, gone to, to in favor of the nitrogen, and when we stop the nitrogen, oxygen again comes back. And why is this important? This tells us that the channel is open, so he has not an obstruction, which is an indirect sign of not having a bacterial infection. So that can actually be used also as a diagnostic fact. We did the correlation with the CT scans, and we can see that for all patients that in, um, in CT had some problem with the sinuses, we also had the same uh, correlation with our optical measurements. So we could use this as, we could have used this as the only detection technique for showing that these were the filled uh, sinuses. As I said before, we have now uh, started to take this over to uh, pediatrics, and the aim here is to find a technique or a, a method for 24-hour non-invasive surveillance of these small prematurely born kids. Because what, what we do now is that we send off uh, samples of blood, and in some cases we also do CT, um, investigation of these small, small babies, maybe 600 gram or so. The definition of being preterm born is when you are born before week 37. Uh, they have um, the, the numbers of all pregnancies in the U.S. are up to 10 percent, 
and particularly the lungs are the ones that are not fully developed because the alveoli has not the coating uh, around them with a the surfactant, which means that the small alveoli collapse and part of the lungs are not um, working as they should. So as I said, we do blood sampling and send that off for, for investigation in the laboratory, which means that we have a general number of the oxygenation. But that doesn't mean that we know which part of the lung is not working. That is more when we do the X-ray based investigation, which of course should be avoided as much as we could. So we have built up a similar system here. And um, what we can do with this is a spatial distribution of the air in the lung loops. We can detect that. And that's very important because that means that we can follow the treatment that they do with the small infants. Because they give them artificial surfactant to the lung, they give them uh, oxygen, and they have them to breathe with this positive airway pressure. But uh, even though they do this, we cannot say which part of the lung is functioning and which is not. So we, we now may have a technique that really could tell us that the, the treatment that they do is working or where it's not working. We have done some preliminary uh, um, studies here. This is a, a full term baby here. He is absolutely too big for this technique, but we did the measurements just to see whether it was. So this is more a proof of principle measurement. And what we saw was a water vapor signal from his intestine. In the first and second derivative here, we see the water, but we could not detect his, um, <coughs> his lungs because he had too thick um, thorax, th thoracic wall, but we could see his intestines here because they are only one centimeter deep here. We did the ultrasound also. So that, that is something that we now hope to introduce into the, the clinic. We have an obstacle here because as we were discussing the other day, uh, the ethical committees these days are very, very tricky. So uh, we have really to convince them that, that we, uh, we do something uh, which is valuable and, and in particular, of course, stress effect where we don't have any um, other conventional techniques and, and that's the, the, the situation for these small kids. So, so that might go through. On the other hand, to work with small babies is also an obstacle because there, there are absolutely special laws for, for working with them. So with this, I um, end and I show this nice colorful picture from uh, Zhao Shaogo in Tibet. Uh, if you ever have any, and, uh, any chance to come to Tibet, to come to China, first of all, you can visit us. To come to Tibet is absolutely gorgeous because there the water is colored like every color that we work with, with in lasers. And I will show you this uh, example also because China is a particular country. I, I never understand it until now. I hope I will understand it after a few more years. This is one of these um, examples on uh, technology, building technology. This Canton Tower, third world, uh, third highest or tallest in the world with the glass floor and of course you feel a little bit stressed when you are standing there with, with a lot of, of 100 meters below. But, but interesting and colorful. So thank you so much. <laughs>